Good evening everyone, uh, my name is Rebecca Spears and this is Suki Shao and it's our pleasure to welcome you here this evening. Um, I'd like to thank you for joining us today to the very first Product Tank Tauranga talk on the inside story of the growth of the local niche SaaS business. So I'm sure this will be of great interest um, to many people in the sphere of product management, um, both for Tauranga locals and also to a wider audience. Um, so for anyone that's not familiar with Product Tank, um, it's an informal meetup that brings together local uh, product community in cities around the world. Um, so whatever your role in product, um, you're, you're welcome. And Product Tanks are always free to attend. Um, they're organized by volunteers from the local product community and they're uh, supported by sponsors and Mind the Product, which is a product events and training company. So in this session, we'll have a Q&A session at the end. So please put any questions in the chat as we go throughout. And Suki will facilitate the Q&A session. Um, and the recording is available on this link that you're watching now for, for later viewing as well. So without further ado, I'll introduce our speaker for the, this evening. So we're very excited to welcome Moira Moroni, uh, co-founder of Booking Rooster, who provide events and course management software. And she's going to take us through the journey of the company from concept to commercialization and take us through how the customer led development program, how the business model has adapted to change and the value that the product delivers to customers. So over to you, Moira. Awesome. Hey, lovely to be here. And um, if there's one thing I really love in life is talking about my baby, Booking Rooster. Uh, so this will be the inside story. I will keep it as quick and punchy as I can and try not to um, bore you with too many uh, Booking Rooster stories. Now, we were playing earlier and um, the, the slide moving worked perfectly, but it's now deciding not to move. Hmm. Um, Right, while I play with the technology, I should be able to get it somehow to allow us to move screens. Suki, you're the expert in this area. Do you want, have you got any brilliant thoughts on having us move the screen? Have you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it should be like a right hand arrow button. Yeah, that's not displaying. It was earlier. Sorry, mm -hmm. guys. And moving it on your own screen, on your own monitor. Yeah, no. Mm, I can um, remove the slides and then come back. That's great. Day. Thanks. Yeah. If you try to move again now. Yeah, same deal. Oh. Shall I stop sharing and start again? Yeah. Okay. I'll stop. I'll re yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry about the technical difficulty. <laughs> yeah. That's, I'll tell you what, I'll start over here as well. And mm -hmm. hey, that's looking much better. Are you seeing that? Um, no, it hasn't come through in the share slide. Mm. Okay, try again. Um, the screen, yeah. Waiting for it to load, I think. Oh, yeah, okay, there we go. Nice. We can see it. Do you want to try that again, Laura? And we can't move it again. Oh, what are we going to do? Um, hmm. Wow, sorry everybody, this is a great start, isn't it? Um, okay. What did you do before to move the, your slides? Good question, isn't it? Oh, that's it. Yeah, we can see your slides. You can see the PowerPoint. side, you can see the um, bits down the side mm. too, right? Yeah, yeah. That's okay. Oh well, we'll do it this way. I'm sorry about the... <laughs> slightly reduced screen size but there doesn't seem to be i'm sure there will be another way but it doesn't seem to want to hold so um, all good all good right. so right take two um so today we're going to cover from concept to commercialization so that's the how we're going to approach it is we're going to start with now so you know what booking rooster is and what it does for people then we'll go through the how which is um how we got from our start in 2010 to where we are now and then a little of the wow factors along the way we will talk about both the ups and the down because i downs i think it's really important when uh particularly for those who are 
about to enter the startup world or a little way through their business development to understand that there's highs and lows um, and that you do take twists and turns along the way. So um, firstly, what does Booking Rooster software do? Um, it's course and event management software, and we focus very much at Booking Rooster on what it achieves rather than the physical nuts and bolts. So that distinguishes us a lot as a software company. We're all about the business and the people running the businesses, not so much about the software. Of course, we've got great software behind us, but we really focus on understanding needs and delivering results. So what it does, it boosts registrations, saves administration time, enhances communication, streamlines processes, elevates brand, powers business, gro business growth, and self-populates to other systems. We've got CRM written there, but think CRM, zero student management systems, online learning systems, all sorts of things. So all of that adds up to delivering a lot of value. Our mantra is, that we must deliver a greater ROI, that's return on investment to our customers, than they pay us. So, so um, it's always got to be a great return on investment and it's always got to be a greater saving or a greater increase in revenue than they're paying us. And living by that principle has really worked for us. Um, for those of you that wonder what this thing physically does, I'm going to give you a quick run over and I am trying to keep it brief because you're Many of you really know a little about a bit about us already and want to know kind of how we got from there to here. Others of you know nothing and just seen, hey, this is a SaaS company. What is this about? So the first thing I would say is if we look here at um, the uh, left hand side of the screen, when we the, the customer journey starts well before they even get the software itself and before they start doing anything, we obviously have a software platform that we've developed over time. Um, it's delivered in the customer's own brand on their own URL predominantly. We do have some um, entry level products that allow for people to co-brand with us if you like. Um, so we've got the software. A very important part of our business model is that we plan with the customer. So we actually, in the case of our larger customers, we'll be doing very complex um, process maps, a little like the one that you're seeing here, but, um, but much more complex when they're, when they're looking at what they do now versus what they do um, once they're with us. And the one will work you through this one. We um, set up for them. Now we take a lot of the pain out of it. We know a lot about the industries we work in, events and um, events and training. And so, often clients can't really articulate what it is they exactly need. Over time, we've developed a really good understanding of those industries so we can have strong input on it. So yes, they need input as we're getting set up, but from day one, we've taken all the pain out and they immediately will be starting straight in here on day eight and course date. So we've got templates for each of the major courses they offer or type of events they offer, and they're set up to their specific needs with their own custom questions and their own um, their own um, pricing, their own everything. Uh, they can change those themselves at a later date, but to get them started quick, we do all of that for them. Um, and then all along the way, there's training and help service. We'll come back to that. So really the pre-go live stuff is really important and much of that balances back and forth in the support as well. So if we look here, the things in the orange are the only thing an administrator has to do to run courses and events on this platform once it's set up. The first is add dates. So I'm running this first aid course on that date and the other and perhaps the advanced one on another date. And it's very quick, about four clicks to add new dates. It can be done via upload for a big organization with lots of dates. Um, and then all these other steps are either automated or can be missed depending on what you want. And at the end, if you're a training business, it might culminate in the administrators in the back end needing to come in here and issue certificates. So you, you do want a, a, man, a, a human to cross check that process. 
So adding dates is critical. When you add course dates, they can automatically feed to all of these things and more, but most commonly to the company's own website, to the calendars of their own team, particularly their trainers in the case of um, the training sector. I will focus on training sector because it has got a lot more detail than events. Um, and this is LMS's learning management system. So some of the bigger customers have quite complex learning management systems. Think of CRM on steroids and specialised to the industry, and they might want those dates fed through into that. Um, from there, once the dates are in, there's lots of special inbuilt tools for the administrators if they choose, light blue is if they choose. If the administrators choose, they can email out about a specific course or a specific type of course, courses in a specific area, all of those things. With templated emails, they can completely customise to themselves at the point of sending. Um, Obviously, through both the email and the web presence and all of those other things, people book. Most of our clients in the training sector and, in fact, in the event sector too, run both public and private events. If the event is public, it's shown on the web, um, on shown at the front end. If it's private, they need to receive the link in order to book. They can make on public courses. The public can make their own bookings. Um, on private courses, uh, sorry, on both public and private courses, the administrators can add bookings themselves. Now, that's really important in the case of larger organisations who might have a lot of really special customers that are used to phoning to book. So we don't say this replaces telephone booking at all. We say, you know, it's horses for courses. And in many situations, you're going to, if someone calls you, you want to capture that book, they capture that um, booking and put it in. Some of our clients have completely replaced telephone with having people book themselves. Um, so you can imagine how much time when people self book this saves because all the data they enter, which at a minimal will be um, for the participant, the name, address, uh, sorry, not address, na name and um, yeah, the name would be minimum for a participant. Obviously, for the person making the booking, we also get their name and voicing details, email address. But depending on our client, they might always also be asking if their students, their date of birth, um, ethnicity and gender are things that have to be reported to NZQA. So they're, if they're doing offering NZQA courses, they may choose to collect that right up front at this point. So lots of information that gets entered here once and never has to be touched again. Obviously, for the custom, for our customers, they like to get people to book themselves, but there are definitely instances where they will get administrators to book. Once that information is in there, if you follow the um, dark lines here, it goes straight through to what I call a roll call, where the trainers of the course can see who's coming and actually ultimately, depending on the client setup, where they might assess the person um, or all of the class members. Um, so again, no manual changes, no emailing people, they save a lot of time. Um, and if we continue on this main line here, um, from there, if, if it's a certified course that's being offered, uh, obviously not if it's an event or um, even a, a, a course without a cert, then in a few clicks, the administrator can approve the certs that really by the assessment and the trainers really um, issued them at the time here and they just get cross-checked and approved. Now, if we um, come along here, there's also bucket loads of reports that either can be manually printed or emailed to the customer or fed into their other existing systems. If we look down here, we've skipped a few here quite deliberately. I want to say that there's, you'll see a lot of feedback loops. So as people book, you can update the, date the calendar with numbers if you want to. Once either public or admin booking, people get automated reminders. Um, a lot of detail gets fed through from the course set up into those reminders to make them really useful and they're really proven to increase um, or decrease no-shows to make sure people turn up. Um, and once a person books, the other major power is whether it's public or admin, it issues the invoice to, usually to the customer and puts it into their accounting system, um, predominantly zero, but also MYOB and several other more bespoke systems or, or less, pop, less common systems. Um, depending on their setup, it can feed information to their CRM and to their student management system again. 
um, over here. Now, oh, so this one here was a learning management system. I beg your pardon, back on LMS, um, which is like Intuito or how they deliver, or sometimes Zoom, how they deliver the online course. Um, all of those things can be updated with various things along the way. What I haven't shown here is the tricky processes, like if a, um, a course has to be postponed, something that was rare until um, two years ago, um, or if somebody cancels. But those are really quick, simple processes. And in fact, what administrators tend to spend more of their time on than anything. So what does that do for customers? It delivers all the things we said. I'm just going to give you a quick view of some of our customers um, and what they say. I don't believe you should take our word for it. Right, so this is Drivetrain from the Hawke's Bay. It's a one-man band operator. Um, and they, as you can see there, deliver truck licensing, forklift tri licensing, all of those kind of things. Um, now, what um, Gary says, and we're not talking cheapest chips software as a service here. We're not talk we, we're talking monthly fees in the hundreds, not the, the tens or the, um, you know, not, not in the tens. Um, so what Gary says here, and just in case you can't read, before Booking Rooster, I was spending around 10 to 15 hours a week matching bookings with payments and re reconciliation. Booking Rooster now does the majority of that work for me. I would now spend a couple of hours a week managing bookings. As a self-employed person, those extra hours were usually done in the evening when at home. I now have more time with the kids and stress levels are way less than they used to be. So one man band, owner operator, massive life change. So it's not just about developing the business, it's about um, it's about um, change, changing, literally changing people's lives, cheesy as that sounds. Um, this is another great example. This is a more recent customer. They joined us last year, Medic First Aid. They run, um, they're um, Taupo based or just near Taupo actually, and run courses in first aid throughout the country. Um, I've chosen them partly because they're local to our, relatively local to our Tauranga audience and be also because uh, Ross, who's one of the owners of the company, um, his title's Master Trainer. He's He's literally one of the guys that trains the trainers. So um, we've got a lot of um, faith in Ross. Now, when we asked Ross the benefits to his business, he actually listed eight things um, and then said there was more, but he was rushing. So um, we've just put a few of them here. What, what is critical for him is unlike some clients, like the people with NZTA courses like um like truck driving generally don't issue their own certificates, these guys do. So for them, it takes them right through that whole process we showed you. So improve cash flow by direct online sales invoicing to customers. Now, that's not just about the fact that the customer gets the invoice straight away. It's about the fact that the invoicing process, invoice is really slickly structured to meet all the invoicing requirements. So that's not just the standard IID ones. It's the fact that, for example, we can force it so that if a major corporate requires their staff to use a PO, they just can't book unless they put a PO in there What where everybody else is using a PO. Uh, sorry, PO is a bit of accounting speak. It's purchase order, and it's just something that some corporates require you to have on an invoice or they literally won't pay it. Um, so it's not just about issuing an invoice like a... Um, like a standard shopping cart would. It's about having all the stuff that's <coughs> required for the industry. Um, so reduce staff hours, processing bookings, um, issuing certificates all the way through, da 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 da. Visibility, you've probably read that while I've spoken, and um, really it just gives you a good idea that there's lots of um, things people need and want. Um, so I'd call Medic First Aid a uh, kind of medium-sized training business in New Zealand terms. And here's a larger one, growing actually. It was probably in the small to medium category when they started working with us several years ago, and now I'd almost put them in a large category. So really doing well. Be Safe's based in Auckland, it delivers courses in um, health and safety and um, uh, you know industrial-related um, courses throughout the country. Um, and what's important about these guys is they're of such a scale that they have got feeds into other systems. Um, no, not quite for Africa, but the, over time they started 
with none and over time they've added more feeds as they've required more systems that reminds me about stu uh, CRM systems. This isn't a full CRM, but for many, many training businesses, it's actually all they need for a good time. And then they move on to having more sales processes where they want to record a lot more interactivity and definitely connecting in with CRM is um, recommended there. So right now, let's get into the main reason you're all here, which is to um, to hear how we got to where we where we are. In the beginning, and I'm going to talk about those first five years first, um, 2010 to 2015. I call it a passion project. So what I mean by that is we thought we had a great idea. We didn't know if it was co um, commercially viable or or not. We um, we just really really weren't sure. So, but we loved the idea, so we got onto it. When I say we, there were three founders originally, myself, Karen Littlewood, and Andrea Nielsen. Karen and Andrea owned, we both, we all had other businesses. Um, Karen and Andrea owned the Tauranga web development company, uh, Mocha, at the time. They were the founders of that um, and handed that on um, around that 2015, 2016 time uh, to um, Andrew and Lisa Mann, who um, picked up that business and run with it, another great to be involved with people that are really um, entrepreneurial and into doing great stuff. So they had their main business. I was running a warehousing operation in the US, but often based here in Tauranga. Um, so we very much did it as something we loved the idea of. It was part time and very experimental. Until 2015, we didn't have anyone else involved in the business. We used um, some Mocha's developers, um, we used um, our own, t we put our own time into it and roped a few friends and family into doing things like testing. We also did go out to the market quite a lot. So we roped in, there may be people listening. I think there certainly were some on the list who were in those early people to give us feedback as to you know how they thought it would work for them. We were very events focused. Our original idea was probably percentage based charging in event sector. We could see a whole lot of things that the big ticketing agencies weren't doing well for community organizations and membership organizations in particular. Over time, we moved away from that. Um, part, we certainly still do that, and we certainly still work for bigger events organizations, but we did find a plethora of little things in the event space that made it a bit harder to cut through. And also in the case of the community groups, and we do service many of them, we'll talk about that soon, um, but um, we did also find that, that some were a little bit um, technology limited. They always had some people that were great on technology, but then others that just weren't sure they wanted to go in that direction. So we started very events focused, we started percentage oriented in our thinking, but we never actually went percentage when we commercialized. We actually started with capital purchase. So um, we got um, larger organizations to commit a capital investment in purchasing our software system. Um, some examples here, um, Zespri, Zespri were our foundation client, they were the first on board. Um, they joined us um, for running grower events predominantly, and they, um, at the time, they thought they would only want us for about two years while they implemented something else internally, um, and we were all happy. All, all parties happy with that. I think uh, they, you know, they still were, they were still with us ten years later. So that that two years um, stretched a long way. Vertical Horizons, big shout out to Ben at Vertical Horizons. He was the first um, person in the training sector that saw the potential of this for training and. Um, he got on board and implemented it at a time that we were getting pushback from every other training person that we talked to, but he just went, yeah, I can see this. So a true, true market leader, and I think testimony to the size that his business has grown to, or the business that he's now chief executive of. Uh, and I've put FOMA in there, Federation of Māori Authorities, for two reasons. Um, firstly, it was a part payment, part sponsorship deal. In the early days, we had to do a, a, quite a few of those. Or, you know, it was a great way to get people on board, get um, live live testing of new product elements, and that with a a friendly um, friendly uh, data customer base, I suppose. They were also one of the reasons that 
when it came to decision time or around that 2015 period that I felt confident that the product was at a place that we could take it forward commercially. And the reason was that they had a major change of staff and um, I got a call one day when I was actually working another job to raise a bit of extra funds. I don't like risking too much capital, so I kind of like my properties and other things as well. So I did another job to get a, a bit of um, increased um, cash to fund the business. And while I was um, doing that, I had a call from her, luckily in my lunch break, because all the others, the other founders weren't free. And, um, and this new person had joined the FOMA. She had to put their national conference up within the next couple of hours and have it live selling tickets. And she'd never seen our system before. In my lunch break, I gave her a half hour over the phone, pre-Zoom days, um, explanation of what to do. And... Um, she was just um, up and away, um, never looked back, never needed another tutorial. And I thought, wow, we've got this to a, a really great level. It was a complex um, conference she was organizing. Decision time. So we knew the training sector had legs. We had ch a changing personal landscape. The image that you're seeing there was of myself, Andrew and Karen, so those are the founders through there, and Jan, who now actually works in business with Andrea. Um, Jan was our original um she was the first person we took on around that 2015-16 um, period as on a part-time basis to help us project manage some of the things that we needed to go and also for customer interface while the rest of us were doing other things. Um, but things were changing for Karen and Andrea. They were selling um, Mocha, which they'd worked really hard on um, and really needed some time out. So um, they... We also needed to make a decision to put a lot more capital into the business. There was still a lot more programming needed to be done to take it from something good to something great. Um, and that was something I was willing to put my hand up for. Uh, we did know that we needed a national sales presence. Um, Karen, for those who know her, is a brilliant salesperson. Andrea, fantastic on um, web design and video and lots of other great things. Um, so, um, but the business really wasn't at a point that it could afford all of us. So this photo, I'm pleased to tell you, although we're talking about 2015 now, this photo was taken in 2017. So that's the Booking Rest of Christmas Party in 2017. Um, so, and even today, they're all re they're very um, strong supporters of us. And we just need to ring if we, if we need anything. The people you're not seeing there are the developers behind the scenes. Um, so are originally all from the Mocha team. Um, and even once Andrew took over the business, he continued supporting us to the extent that he could. Um, and Brendan, our lead developer, came out of Mocha, I know, um, and we and that he still did. And I think to this day does a little work back for Mocha when they need it. So, um, you know, it's a reciprocal relationship. So I took the plunge and took it on, and it's been great. Our first two years weren't that wonderful, um, and I guess you expect that when you're starting a business, but I probably didn't quite expect all the challenges. Um, oops, I've gone straight into the good stuff. So I wanted to mention a few of the growing pains because if you're out there planning something, you'll want to know those. I am just checking the time here occasionally if I look away from you. Um, this little sudden screen issue means I can't see it on my screen. Right, so growing pains. When we first went out to customers, oh, immediately after I took, oh, took um, on on the business in my own right, um, without uh, Karen to do the sales and knowing we needed a national presence, we plunged straight in um, with a salesperson and then business development manager, Chris Winslade, who was actually the other person in the photo we didn't, I showed earlier. So what Chris found when she went out is that we were either too early, and by that I mean people just didn't think they needed online anything back then, bizarre as it seems, it seems a short time ago to me. We were too late, and too late for a short time, I would say. And what I mean is that they'd put in a shopping cart or they'd put in something they thought was on an online system and just didn't realise there was more to be had or it was so fresh that they, you know, it wasn't the time for them to consider some changing again. Or it was nearly right. Now, nearly right was great because it was an opportunity, um, but it also put pressure on development. Sorry, that's the third bullet point there. But, um, you know, that was a direct cause and effect. Um, I think at that point, um, we 
also realized that there were some things people wanted we didn't know about. So I've got a bullet point there um, that the pay for support limits feedback. So there were a lot of things that our then existing client base knew, but because they'd purchased as a capital purchase and paid you know, per rate per hour for support, they were reluctant to pick the phone up and talk to us. They just didn't want to risk spending the money. And so we just didn't know it. And had we, in hindsight, had we known it a lot earlier, I think we would have been a lot better prepared um, to, um, to take the market on in that point. So I would say to anyone in this space, if you're thinking about charging hourly rates, just think about whether you can build support in even if it's in the early days for specific clients so that you can be sure that they do contact you when they need help instead of sitting on it and you don't know that either you've got a problem or that you've got a whole opportunity out there that you haven't exposed. And again, credit to Ben at Vertical Horizons. Once we realised that and started talking heavily to his team, um, we were certainly able to make a lot of inroads into new features before they hit us from... Um, new clients and that helped sales experience. The pressure on development was really intense then because we suddenly found that we needed a whole lot more features because everyone was demanding them. It was capital intensive, um, that's pretty hair raising. And what we did find is we needed to refine the target market, not for the long term, but for the short term so that we weren't so bombarded. Tech just was struggling. We had other externals join, but we just couldn't get Program at the program and test, which is critical, and trial and all of those things at the rate that we really needed for the customers whose doors we're knocking on. So we switched tank and we developed our product called Events Pronto. So that's a community events booking platform. Um, and that one was a lot less intensive because it, it really worked. You know, there wasn't anything they needed. The price point was very low, so they couldn't. So um, they were really grateful for the great range of. Um, they got. We targeted the community sector and small, um, very small businesses, and it, it was a brilliant. It is a brilliant product and was right from day one. Yeah. Um, breast cancer tauranga. So the types of organisations that use that breast cancer tauranga, um, um, who were actually a foundation client for that, collaborate. Um, so that's a Wellington-based organisation, and you may read here and there about Sarah Tuck, who's um, won some splendid awards for her work in the, um, I'm going to say in the mental health space, but also in entrepreneurship and innovation. And the Com Cambodia T Charitable Trust, well known to the um, Tauranga marketplace, I'm sure. And most particularly, they, those guys, oh, Devon, who is one of their fundraising arm, and obviously Denise and the team behind her um, or in front of her, however you like to think of it. Um, fantastic fundraisers, really, really great events and brilliant planning. Right. So those were, but, you know, so we went down a few sidetracks, I might say. What's worked for us is the principles we've used. We're going to talk briefly about development principles and then about the sales and marketing. The first one and probably the most important is that we put reliability and data privacy first. So we don't sacrifice anything for that. It's paid off with some of our clients that we don't talk about um, because they're government agencies that don't like to be known, put it that way. Um, it's paid off because we quite quickly attracted those. It's paid off, um, it also helps our clients, often because they know we're so committed to that, if they have a question about their own obligations, they'll ring us and interact with us and we can, you know, we can share knowledge, which is fantastic. The second key development principle was the one we learned by trial and error, that of strong customer feedback loops. So even today, support, development, sales, all interact strongly so that we're trying to predict what the next highest priority will be in terms of winning the next customer and also keeping our existing customers progressing, um, both in terms of increased efficiencies and um, in terms of greater marketing potential, all those things. Um, we have, and I, perhaps we developed this around that critical decision time in 2016. Um, we fiercely go for integration before invention. And what I mean like that, 
integration means kind of connecting to other systems, so connecting to zero rather than building an accounting system, correct, connecting to a wide range of CRMs rather than building a full-blown CRM. There's, the main, main reason for that is that people then get the best of both breeds. We're brilliant at the course management aspects, um, at the event management aspects, but there are great accounting products, great CRMs out there, um, great online learning systems. So we're not going to try and do things that other people already do brilliantly, but we do our part of the equation and we help people to mesh them all together. Really, the, a lot of platforms say they are, say, zero integrated, but being zero integrated and having a really good set of business rules that really do everything in zero that you need are two different things. So what I mean by that is if you're an accounting geek, you'll know that um, when you put an invoice into zero, you need to co you need to have the line items pre-coded so that they go into the, the right codes. And there might, in today's will be multiple codes with just one, I don't know if somebody's booking one first aid um, training course, the person booking the full course will have about five codes go with them to zero. The person booking the refresher will have a a different five codes or some the same and some different. So it's getting all of that right. It's the very special rules we have to make sure that even if I've never booked on this system before, there's about a 99% chance that I, if I'm from a corporate, my, I'll go into that corporate's account in zero rather than a new account being created. It's impossible to, um, to prevent some new accounts being created, but over time we've developed a really great system for that. So integration, not invention, don't repeat the wheel and just try and build an accounting system that would be too distracting and purposeless. Customer lead prioritization. So we're always looking at what customers want and that's driving our priorities. There's a lot of things I have, I always write from day one, I've had a massive list of things I want the platform to do and the software to do in the future. Um, but I have to um, sit on my hands and let the team remind me about what we, um, you know, what the customer priority is and the customers directly remind me as well. Um, here's a picture, um, I'm going to say that's from 2016, and that's of our lead developer, Brendan, myself and Chris, our first business development manager in one of our um, planning sessions with our own website on the screen for the um, to have promotional purposes. But um, what I would say about that, Brendan has been our lead developer in, since day one. He worked um, as a contractor to Mocha and then shared Mocha and us for a long while. And his, um, he's not dedicated to us. He does work for others at times, but predominantly works for us now. Um, and so he's been with us from the beginning. Brendan works from home in Omaru. We hadn't met him at all for probably, I don't know, for a long time while he was with Mocha. Um, now I meet up with him normally once a year. Um, the last year has been a bit challenging. And frankly, from a risk perspective, we've chosen not to put um, Jenna, who's who replaced Chris um, some time back. We've chosen not to put Jenna, um, Brendan and myself all in the same room together. Um, and in fact, we've chosen to keep him quite isolated. So there's no risk that will infect him for some, with something because we are the critical people for the business. We do contract other developers as needed. Um, all right. Moving on to sales and marketing principles. So our original idea had been an events percentage based. That would have been all marketing, all online marketing. When we moved to a serious software it's a lot more complex and it really needs an interpersonal um interpersonal um contact so um this is jenna who came on board gosh jenna i know you're listening in there i'm probably going to get the year wrong but i think it was 2017 and she is both what you might call sales and support um and since that time, she has been phoning people, recording what happened, following up and repeat. So it's phone, record, follow up, repeat, phone, record, follow up, repeat. It's actually more powerful than that because she focuses on two things, the people themselves, understanding them and understanding their business. So she doesn't go in with sales 
and we've had some great sales coaching along the way, including from our um, our founder, Karen. Um, but she focuses on getting to know and understand those businesses, and when the time's right, um, they come on board. The changing from a that what I have missed saying is that at the same time that I took over, it took us about two years to fully commit to transitioning fully to a software as a service business or SaaS business. I, what that means for those that aren't into tech, software as a service in simple speak is where somebody pays you usually sometimes percentage based in our case, a fixed monthly fee to use your technology. And in our case, it's a fixed monthly fee and but they may pay more or less depending on the range of services that they need. Um, and usually that's pretty much fixed. In our case, they also might pay for extra additions or which I'd almost call customizations. Um, but I'll come, uh, but I missed mentioning that earlier. We don't customize, we configure as much as possible, which means that we, if we add something new for one person, we add it in a way that others might have it something we can switch on or off, not at the level they control themselves normally, but at a level that we control, any of our support team can control. There's also a lot they control themselves, but so we give them the ability to have new features on or off. The, so we've moved, what software as a service does is give you what we call a recurring revenue model. So it means that once you've onboarded the client, the month on month, you normally can expect income from them. And that certainly worked in that way for us. So it's certainly been recurring revenue. It grows on you. So over time, you know, your, your revenues grow. Um, the pain of it was the transition from capital purchase where we were getting great lump sums in to fund the business and down to um, only getting a fraction of that each month. But in the long term, it's paid, it's paid off. The next point says the Zoom revolution. Now, in the, in the days pre, pre-COVID, pre we have to say it, people often wanted to see us face to face and it was really difficult to communicate the product to people over the phone. Once we did try um, to get people to do online, um, to do Zoom sessions effectively, but they were all very nervous of the technology and didn't want to do it. Come COVID, we suddenly found that although we had suffered some pain in our event sector, um, we had a new opportunity because a lot of the training businesses we'd been talking to who really didn't want a personal visit or they were um, a long way away. So we had to, um, you know, for cost reasons, had to really schedule them in. Suddenly they were available um, on Zoom and suddenly wanted to do Zoom. So um, we were able to make great inroads from a sales perspective by riding the Zoom, Zoom trend. And now it's we pretty much don't find anyone who isn't prepared when the time's right for them to think about our service to jump on a Zoom call. Um, and again, sticking to, we've mentioned it earlier, we always deliver clients a strong return on investment. That's our principle. When we're looking at is this person a prospect or not? We look at that. For some, our events pronto platform, which is at a much lower price point, I think the entry level for that is, uh, do you know, wish you were right here. I think it's $49 a month plus just, something like that. Um, the um, we, we will channel some down there if that's the market that they're in so that, you know, we don't channel somebody into a more expensive product if it's not right for them, either now or for the future. And now I think it's, we will hand over shortly, but before we do that, a very quick um, overview of some of the things we've achieved, the wow factor, right. The median annual revenue increase for training sector businesses rose in rose 28% between the 2020 and 2021 calendar years. So this is training sector. It's still been very challenging for them. Yet on average, our clients from that sector grew their revenue between 2020 and 2021, 28%. So that's that's a great achievement for us. Like 
that makes me really smile. We're doing what we've set out to do. If you're a numbers person, you might have noticed I use median there, not average. Um, reason for that is the average is ridiculously high. It's skewed by um, one particular client that had, um, had increases that are through the roof. Um, interestingly, um, nobody had massive, lo ma massive decreases. In fact, only one decreased at all. Um, in terms of booking Rooster itself, I've been trying to think how I can convey this without giving you competitive information, but I thought this would be useful. Um, this is the annual percentage growth in the Rooster's own revenue, um, and it's for the calendar year compared with the um, previous year. I started at 20. 18. Um, it's fair to say 2016 and 17 were very lean years, and then we started to get momentum. So um, you'll see here, great, good year in 2018, great year in 2019. And we think 2020 and 21, still this is growth. So that's if I accumulated that, you would add up to our, our revenue. Um, but this is the percentage growth over the previous year. So given the challenges of those years and 2020, in both years, actually, there were times where we absolutely couldn't sell. It would not have been the right thing to approach anybody and say, hey, you know, we'd like your business. Um, uh, you know, people were really hurting. We did spend a lot of time in those times with our existing customers, putting in new um, things urgently. A lot more went to use um, the Intuito online learning system, which we integrate with. So that's a, a delivery of information system and Zoom and those kind of things. So we did a lot of helping them. A lot had to suddenly postpone courses. No one had done that. So we had we brought in new tools to help them mass postpone and recreate courses, all sorts of things along those lines. So we were a little bit um, we were a little bit busy to do a big sales effort. So we're really happy with what we achieved there. Um, and I think we'll sum it up with some words from um, our great friend Ross, who had the list of eight um, things. This one also makes me smile. Having the oops, capital is missing there. Having the Booking Rooster team effectively join our team with around the clock support, helping us look after our customers. That's ultimately what we're about. We're extending people's people's teams, both with our technology and with the support that we give people. And on that note, I'll hand back over. Great. Thank you for such an insightful story into how Booking Rooster has come to be. So right now, we would like to take some questions from the viewers that are online. And we've also got some questions for you as well, Maura. Great. Now, I'll just say I've not seen the questions. I did see them in our practices, but they're not on my screen. So you guys just <laughs> don't buy them at me. That's all right. Um, there were one of the first questions I have. It's about how did you come up with what are the core features of Booking Rooster at the beginning? At the beginning, we had a good idea from our own personal experiences. And I think that's you know sometimes said to be a bad thing. But at the time, people were still, I'd be in the US and I'd get an email um, from a professional organization I belonged to asking me if I wanted to come to an event. And to reply, I would have to find somewhere to print it, fax it back seriously you know that short this is 2010 wow. we're talking about um <laughs> then i'd have to go and manually enter it in my diary and it was driving me nuts i just wanted to be able to click some links and enter my data and and have it in my diary so initially it was very much about karen and andrea looking for a web product and us tossing ideas around and that was a big point of frustration for me then so that started with that but it grew as we got to understand the sector and the market it really grew and all the way along the features other than that base that we put that together quite quickly but other than the base features it was for in the early days it was focus groups it was going to trade shows only to get feedback i didn't mention perhaps strongly enough and even in jenna's um conversations today she's always looking for what do they want what do they need what do they think they need how are things working for them where would be the potential 
to improve it. I would say that particularly between Karen, Andrea and I at the start, we had um, very, very good understanding of business practices. I've run three businesses. Um, they both have more than one successful business. So we kind of, we did know the business side of things really well. Yeah. Wow, I see. Yeah, so it's a combination of personal pain, pain point plus your business experience that has really led you to create another business together. Yeah. Um, yeah. And as you're prioritizing those customer features, and I hear that you've got multiple different customer profiles as well, like how did you manage that? Yeah, it, it, look, that does keep us awake at night sometimes. We know everybody's wanting things urgently. Um, but we do look, and we've certainly been down some rabbit holes and some sidelines where someone desperately wanted this, and for whatever reason, we thought, yeah, that's great, and no one else wanted it. So quite... Um, you know, after a couple of years experience, we definitely started learning to listen and the, we'd never run down a hole if somebody mentions it once. We now just say, look, we don't do that. Or yes, it's available as a custom edition. Um, I use custom a bit lightly because we don't, we always make it in a way that our guiding principles, we have to be able to upgrade everybody regularly to keep the technology current and give them mm -hmm. the options of the new system so we don't customise to the level that, that that's um, challenged. But um, we certainly don't encourage people to do anything until we've heard it from multiple customers and potential customers. Um, and then we look at what we think the business impact of it is. So they'll tell us, but we'll also, sometimes people might um, really need it in their their business, but it's not going to have overall good impact for everyone. So we do make just um, qualitative judgments on that. And the whole team have feedback. We also look at how quick can we get it done. So we might have a brilliant idea, mm -hmm. but it's going to slow down other development for a long time. So we might put in, we'll do a run of quick wins and then a longer project, run of quick wins, longer project. Mm, I, yeah, yeah, I can, I can see how you are factoring in that visibility as well as that desirability or the design principles of what the product development team is supposed to do. Nice yeah. one. Along the way, I hear you saying that you've got like higher contractors to be software developers and sometimes they work mostly with your software as well. Like for those decisions of like who to hire and for what role to hire, for example, you hired Jenna as well, how did you make those decisions? They're the hard, they're probably the hardest decisions. So I was fortunate in that Karen and Andrea had the networks already and great developers we knew. And Andrew has continued that, continued that with Mocha um, and was willing to come, you know, to be side. We've just looked for talent and grabbed them when we can. Um, but it's not always easy. The same in the sales space. Um, in the sales space, I've shown you Chris and I've shown you Jenna. The very first people we employed, person we employed, it just really didn't work out. And very fortunately um, mm. for me, he understood that himself really quickly. And um, but we did lose probably four or five months at the start where um, things weren't right for him personally, and it wasn't able. You know, we we had. You know, it just we stalled out. So everybody makes mistakes. It's one of the hardest things in business. And in that case, we had used every HR tool. We'd done personality testing. Um, we'd had multiple people interview. We'd you know we'd done our homework, but it, it just you know got him at the wrong time in his life would be the right way to put it. So mm -hmm. yeah, very very difficult. Mm -hmm. Very very difficult. Rebecca, did you have a question that you want to ask? Um, yeah, I was wondering about if when you're kind of looking back, is there anything that you would have done differently? Kind of <laughs> Great question. I think everybody would and everybody in business should should have a long, long list of those. For <laughs> me, there's much of me wishes we had invested more in development earlier so that when so that we had more features early on. But I'd also temper that with saying if we'd done that, we would have gone, we would have sidetracked ourselves with more features that weren't necessary. So, but mm. on balance, yes, I think I, I would like to, I think I should have invested, personally, at the point that I took it over, I should have invested more capital at that time. I'd definitely, looking back, do that. Um, 
Yeah, that would be my mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I was also wondering kind of what, what are you most excited about going forward? Um, that's interesting because it's changed. Up until recently, I've been excited about new features all the time. I'm just excited about the new feature. <laughs> I think um, what I'm excited about going forward is that we have all of the key features that I've really, really wanted, and we've certainly got a lot more, but then none of them are what I call deal breakers with clients where, where and a deal breaker isn't necessarily just because they won't go for it if it doesn't have this. It's because I'm very process oriented and efficiency orientated and I'll look at it and go, ah, oh, I really wish they had this as well because that would make such a big difference to them. So I feel really great about being able to, all the relationships we're entering now, all of that is in place, all of that's well proven. Yes, there are more things we want to do, but none of it is um, is impacting, you know, is, is a serious um, deficiency. It's all nice to have icing on the cake, not, gee, they really need that. So I'm excited about work, about the quick fire, like being able to get things up and running and not have anyone waiting on things they absolutely need. Because you've got things to a really good level so you can just iterate really quickly from that point. Yeah, yeah exactly. We we know our stuff. We know what we're implementing. We just can go in and do things really quickly for people and really, really well for people. Um, we've all, um, particularly the, the key team, Jenna and Brendan and myself, we all know everything inside out. Um, my biggest fear would be losing any of the either, uh, you know, particularly either of them. Um, Brendan's been with us since the beginning. Jenna is listening in, but I think she's um, she's committed to staying. Um, so we, yeah, look, we, um, how do we build that team? I think one of the things about it is we recognise their own personal needs. So um, Brendan has things he does on a Monday, so we um, we respect that. He'll help us out in emergency on a Monday, but we respect his Monday. Um, Jenna has a daughter who's now nearing 13, so if she has school things, she works her day. Um, we work around each other. I have um, not so much in the last two years, but I've always had quite a few travel commitments um, from my personal life. So, you know, they fill in a lot more for me when I'm um, traveling. So, yeah, it's uh, we work as, as a team respecting each other and we seriously all value each other. Mm. Mm. I'm hearing a really strong team, which, yeah. <laughs> which is really important for the business to go forward. Mm. Yeah, if there are no more questions online, then we might wrap it up. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Mm. Um, so yeah, well, everyone, that wraps up our session for this evening. Um, so on behalf of Product Tank Toronga, thank you all so much for making time in your busy schedules um, to join us today. And special thanks to Moira for being our first speaker. Much appreciated, Moira. Um, Suki and I would also like to thank the people that have um, helped get us um, this far. Um, so Anthony from Product Tank um, Auckland and Product Aotearoa. Tokes from Product Tank Wellington, Jace from Product Tank Brisbane, and um, Will from Mind the Product in the UK. They've all sort of helped us support, um, just get things set up behind the scenes and just get things rolling. Um, they morphed this meetup from its original form, which was Digital Tarot, into a Product Tank so that it could just have a more sort of international connection. Um, so there, this, all of this just helps us connect um, the product company uh, community of Taronga with the international product tank community. And yeah, that's just really exciting, um, especially if we're in, in a region and it's not so easy to access the things that are in a big city. Um, and I think that just benefits everyone in terms of making connections, meeting people, just learning new things, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, the recording will be um, is available on the, on the link that you've got now um, on YouTube. So please share it on to anyone that um, you know that might be interested and couldn't make it today. And we'll keep you posted um, on the next event. And yeah, please let us know if you've got any feedback or if there's any questions or speakers or topics um, you'd really like to hear about um, for future events. And you can contact either of us through LinkedIn or the Meetup group. And yeah, look forward to interacting with you again. And thanks to everyone for your time again. And hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening. And thank you, Mara, for the story. <laughs> thank you, everyone. All right. Bye. See you, everybody. <laughs> Bye.
Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye. Bye.